Hi everyone, so let's just start exploring some very simple methods. So imagine that you have the Google Daily Closeness of Price and you can use this data set from this library, FPP2, which is actually the companion library for this excellent book that I mentioned in the previous video. So imagine that you have this, this is in dollars and you want to make some predictions about the future. So what is going to happen after this day? So we can use a very simple model which is take the last data point and this is going to be what is going to happen in the future and of course you assume that it's going to be variability around this point but this is the, the simplest thing that you can do another thing that you can do is assume that okay you can see lows and ups but essentially this is going to fluctuate around the mean so you could guess that in the future that you, you're going to be around the mean value of the series you could also think no google increases its value as time goes on, so I'm going to make a linear regression. So I'm go this is time, this is the value. So I'm going to assume that this is growing in time. So in the future, I, I prefer to think that this is the trend line. And of course, you could say, no, I like this idea of fluctuating around the mean, but of course, the last 90 days are going to be more important than the previous days. So instead of using the mean of all the series, I'm, I'm going to take just the last three months. Of course, if you take a look at the real data, you see some things like this. So like in the past, you have some huge values. Sometimes something happened here. Probably Google bought, I don't know, YouTube or something. And then you have these huge leaps. So you could guess that probably everything that you have tried to do uh, until now is not it's going to be very accurate. One of the methods that we've seen before is called the average method. And essentially we're saying that in each periods in the future, we're going to take that the prediction is going to be the mean value of, of t periods in the past. So if we start at 1, essentially we're saying that this is going to be the mean value of all the time series. If we change this by a different number, it's going to be the mean value of that different number. So in this part of the course, we're going to use massively this library called forecast. And using this forecast is very simple. So we have this function autoplot, and we can take the data set, the time series data set, and then we can add some layers. In this case, we can add a layer, this is called auto layer, and we're going to use the mean, mean f means, re represents mean forecast. So we're going to do, take the average of the data set using 40 periods in the future, and we're going to use this label mean, which is what you can see in the legend here, and I'm going to leave this part pi for, for another part of the video. So you can see here that the, the prediction is really poor because the mean value is not very representative of what has happened. So you have these huge leaps in the data. So this is going to be a really poor performance. Another type of method, the first one actually is the, the naive method. And here we're, we're saying that all the values in the future, in the, eight, in the, in the next H uh, time steps, is going to be the same as the last data point. And again, you can add some layer. So we have the original plot, the mean value, and then we are another layer. And this is going to be the random walk forecast. And random walk means that we only take the last value. And this is called random walk because basically we're, we're just jumping up and down. And this is called also the naive method. Okay. And you can see that the method is not bad for, for the data series. And actually this random walk is really accurate for a stock market because sometimes the, the values in the future are, are completely uncorrelated with the values in the past. And remember that this random walk means that basically the signal is pure noise. So another method which is an improvement of the naive method is called the seasonal naive method. So if you remember time series for the electricity demand, so you have a couple of periods here. So this is weekly period and you can see that this is repeated over and over again. You also have some periodicity day by day because in the morning the, the electricity demand is going to be different than in the afternoon. But basically you could use this, this period M. So seasonal naive method means that you're taking the future and just extrapolating the future using one period in the past. So this M is going to be a week for instance and this K plus one is going to be the last week or the last period. Okay. So you can take a look at this at, at the Google data and you cannot distinguish between the signals because the stock market price is not very seasonal. So you don't see any, any differences week by week. And that's why the seasonal naive and the naive methods are almost the same. The next method is called the drift method. This is related to the linear regression that we draw in the first slide. And the idea is that the future is going to be a, a linear function of the past. And this is going to be a straight line. And the slope is going to be the number of beans in the future divided by the number of periods in the past that we are using to predict. So this is the, the, the equation for the straight line. And you can see that this is the straight line for all the time series. And the prediction is going to be following that trend. Okay, so here you have a comparison of all the methods. 
Of course, if the data series is different, so these are beer sales in Australia, and you can see that you have some periodicity in time. So probably in, in summer, consumption is different than in winter, and this is why you have these spikes. As you can see here that now seasonal naive is the, the one that captures better the trend because you still have the last point is important and, and that's why the purple is related to the last point but you're jumping back in time so you're correcting using the last period so here's a good prediction of the past uh, on the other hand the drift is not very good because this is a kind of linear regression of all the time series and of course the basic naive method is not very good Again, the mean depends on the time series that the time period that you're using. You take the mean of the whole series, it's not good, but if you take the mean of just one part of the series, it's going to be a little better. Again, this is really simple to use this, so you can just uh, use auto plot to take this beer and then add different la layers using different methods. We still haven't talked about this argument PI, and this is related to the fact that these predictions are really accurate, so we don't have any idea of uncertainty. So going back to regression, remember the concept of residuals and residuals are basically the difference between observed and computed. And they are useful because they, they allow us to check if, if the model has captured the, the data properly. So a good forecasting method would yield residuals with the following properties. So the residuals have to be uncorrelated. Otherwise, we could use these correlations in order to improve forecast. And the second property is that they have to have zero mean. Otherwise, they are biased in the sense that they are shifting the trend of, of the time series in, in one direction or the other. This actually is related to the hypothesis behind linear regression. It's try to assume that the residuals are normally distributed. In that case, we can estimate what is the band of confidence, the band of uncertainty around the prediction using these coefficients, this, this prediction interval, and, and this value changes with the, the accuracy of the prediction. So if we are in the 95% interval, we multiply this parameter here that I'm going to talk about later. If we have if we were less pred prediction ability, with this is coefficient is going to be 0.28, and with 99% confidence, we have to use a large value of this parameter. And this coefficient essentially is estimated from the residual. So this is giving us information about the standard deviation of the error. Take a look at this. So this is the average method again. What, what if we use this argument PI equals true? Now we are plotting these bands. These are really poor estimation. But remember that the, the average method is taking the average of all the time series. And this is called the 88% confidence interval, this darker part. And this lighter part is called the 95% confidence interval okay we can if, if we want to plot just one method we don't need to use auto plot and then the layer we can use the simpler simpler no simpler version which is called auto plot and then just uh, take the, the value okay what about the naive method here this is interesting because the naive method allow us to to increase the uncertainty as we proceed in the future and the idea is that we are taking information about the error that we have committed in the past and the farther we are from the last point, of course, the, the less relevant it's going to be that last point. And this makes a lot of sense. So, so again, here we have the 80% confidence interval and the 95% confidence interval. What about the drift method? The drift method, remember that this is a kind of linear regression of the series. And also we have some drift in the, in the uncertainty bars. So we are increasing these lines and also this, they are following the trend. So again, these intervals are not flat. They are uh, have information about the method itself. And finally, the naive method with seasonality. Here we have these predictions and also the uncertainty goes with the flow. So you can see that when we have the predictions are low, also the confidence interval are decreasing and so on and so forth. And what about if the residuals are not normal? So here we cannot use this trick of multiplying by the standard deviation of the residuals. And we have to do something more fancy. And this idea is called bootstrapping. And the idea is taking the data over and over again. So instead of using the same standard deviation, we try to use the method to predict in the, into the future one step at a time. For instance, for the naive method, we take the, the next value. It's going to be the same as the, the value before. And then we're going to use the residual of the previous value. And then we project into the future. So remember, we are using the same values in the past, but we are using the, the error that we committed in the last step. So we are comparing the prediction in the previous step and then moving into the future. And then we, are, we can do this over and over again into the future. So we plug the, the error that we have committed in the past in order to predict the future. You can do this very simpler, simply using the forecast library in R. And basically we have to add this parameter bootstrap equals true 
and here we go so this is very noisy and this makes a lot of sense and now and also love this plot for a couple of reasons first of all we are this is not symmetric and this is this makes sense because the, we have this growing trend into the future so even if we are using the naive method in which the future is going to be the last point we have some information about the past so the errors that we have committed in the past we also can plot this uh, instead of plot just print the outside and you can see the last steps in the bootstrapping so we are doing a lot of bootstraps a lot of samplings into the future and you can see how these errors are correcting and how are already a 99 percent intervals growing with with time you can do this also for seasonality and you can see that now we have also some asymmetry there and I like this method, but the problem is that we have to do some simulations into the future. So this is going to take a longer than using the normal distribution. But I think you should check both methods, the, the standard one and the bootstrapping one, in order to be confident that the residuals are not normal.